This is a presentation of the United States Australian Football League, the USAFL. Back pockets. Okay. Hey, boys. All right. Use your voice all day. Use your voice, okay? Swatteroos on three. One, two, three. Swatteroos. Go, boys. One, two, three, three. Go in that quarter, which is fantastic. Back here in Dublin, Ohio, for the ninth and final game of the 2024. U.S. AFL Super Regionals. As we get set, the sun sets on this fantastic venue, both here in Dublin and here at Dowry Fields. This is the coup de gras, the men's division one, the final game of it, with a chance to give another trophy. Will the Austin Crows win yet another championship, or will it be spoiled by the upstarts from Baltimore, the Dockers? Hi, everyone. Brian Barish alongside Dan Sarbacker, former USA Revolution player, current coach of the national team. This is this will be very, very interesting how this game goes. Austin at 2-0 with a victory could lock up the another Division I regional championship. Baltimore could spoil the party, but they would have to win big and get some help. Yeah, <clears throat> so this is our first chance to see Austin up close on the day. They've, they've been on the other oval where we haven't been broadcasting. Um, and obviously that game against Denver would have been would have been a big uh, rivalry match. Those those sides have met in grand finals and, and championship games plenty over the last handful of years. So um, Austin came out the winner there. They've got the direct path uh, to the trophy here at the regionals. Um, but spoiler could be the opposition here. All is underway. We are on. We are running here in this final game. The Crows wearing the blue jumpers and the white shorts. They are headed from left to right. Baltimore is in the orange and the black. Not like the Flyers, though, as the ball is up on the far side. Big hit, big tackle thrown in there by the man in 45. And the Crows, as we mentioned, have won both of their games today, and they are known for being a very polished and very physical side. But Baltimore, who is playing this third game, is also has also played well and they will clear this one out the back dropped in front nice mark taken and they'll have a chance for goal here what will be interesting to see in the early going here um you know i think baltimore's not going to have any any uh confusion at the fact that they're up against a tough side but can they get in and disrupt the strategy what are the crows doing that baltimore can get in and start to disrupt uh what what are the structures that they they want to execute on and can they start to get in and blow those up um you know, right here, the, the Crows uh, really kind of off the first bounce have... have um, this is just, Justin Harris's kick on the way. It is dead center, perfect. And the Crows have drawn first blood after one minute of football. And Austin leads six to nothing on the Watch AFL scoreboard. And now it's going to be a lot harder. And there's the thing, is the thing Austin, uh, uh, Dan, about Austin is that the Crows, they, there's a certain way that they play. There's a certain thing that they do. They're so well at finding the at finding the open player. They're so well at they're so good at their at, at clamping down defensively. I mean, Baltimore's in for a real real test. Yeah, but they they've got to lift themselves here and get in these contests and not allow Austin to do what they want to do and dictate the terms of this game. Great example right there. That tackle laid. Let's do another ball up. That's a win for Baltimore right there because Austin wasn't able to execute that tap the way they wanted. Exactly. You want to disrupt as much as they can, as much as you can, and really kind of throw them off their game. It is possible. Ball drops in front. Going to be picked up and cycle around as Stefan Barr finds the former L.A. Dragon and Ryan Hitch. Hitch, 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 and a ride. This one dropped in front. Going to be cleared out by Baltimore. There's the 21. He gets this one free, and this one is out in front now going back to pick up and being taken down ball cried the crowd no matter there is Sebastian Aguiari all five foot six inches of him the former president of the USAFL number 14 and will have a ball up and we got to mention Seb because he spent seven years as president of the USAFL guided this league through the uh, through the pandemic and uh, he came over and said hello to me and I, I it's, it's great to see him back. He said he retired about five years ago, but he's still out there playing. Yeah, it's hard to get fully out. I think a lot of, a lot of veterans that say, oh, yeah, it's time to retire. And we end up getting a few more games every year. And 
Um, yeah, great to see him out there getting a run and chosen, selected as a starter here. Yeah, absolutely. Ball comes in once again. We'll take a look at where the how these teams have fared so far today as that one is pumped forward by Henry Kerr, by Harry Kerr, who won Division IV uh, best and fairest a season ago, rather the reserves division a season ago at Nationals. And this one is sent down the line, almost diving in. Did he take that? No, he didn't. Going after that one was Rob Pasolo. Watch AFL scoreboard 6-0. Quick look at how this has gone. Uh, Austin beat Minnesota 47-7, and then that close game against Denver 45-31. Remember, it was the Bulldogs who defeated the Crows in a win after the siren last year to snatch the championship away from them. Yeah, I said this before on a broadcast. Any good rivalry relies on each side having taken something from someone else that they thought they deserved. And I'm sure that year uh, the Crows thought, oh, we had that in the bag. Denver comes back, wins that regional competition, and the Crows end up, end up winning the premiership of the USAFL that year. So they've each drawn blood, and I'm sure there's – no love lost between those sides. Not at all. And you know what? It's since 2015 when this regionals format has started. Only twice have the Crows not won the regional championship. 2017 when we lost when they lost to the then Dallas Magpies uh, in Little Rock. As this one comes up in the middle, the hitch was shoved out of the way, but no call. As that one pops in the air, two-on-one contest. The Crows have it there. Able to skittle this one out to the far side. Big shove. And then going down, picking that one up, going and trying to run on with it. And big tackle. He was taken down without the footy. No call. Pops that one up high in the air. Big shovel pass back on. Off the foot of uh, 27 who we don't have here as this one comes back into the middle of the ground. Another big shove in ba Baltimore trying to push this one forward. Again, still down 6 to nothing. They've managed to calm things down a little bit after that early slap to the face as the he spun around. Ball cried the crowd. Ball says the umpire. Free kick to the Austin Crows. Yeah, here you're right. I think um, Baltimore has steadied a little bit. I still think they're not getting the numbers around the contest they'd like to see. Um, you know, Austin's been able to move the ball a little more freely. The Crows are just looking, for, or excuse me, the, the uh, Baltimore side is just looking for those chances to pick up loose balls. If they get more numbers at the ball, they might be able to run out in packs a little better. Baltimore lost their first game to Denver 55 to 9 came back and beat Minnesota 57 to 6 in a game that uh, in a game that we had we've had all three of their games so far there's one is high in the square knocked down and a free kick in front and it will go the way of Austin and they'll have a chance to extend their lead stars uh, I thought it was a bit generous to pay yeah. that. I don't know that he actually had his hands in front. He, in the end, as they all came to ground, maybe had uh, had contact with the football. Um, was that Steve on the mic on the uh, whistle there? I think might a little generous. So maybe the footy gods uh, overruled on this and just awarded the behind. Yeah, uh, uh, ball don't lie, as 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 we say. <laughs> one one seven. Watch AFL scoreboard. No score for the. Uh, for the other team, that would be the Baltimore Dockers, the orange team, again, refer referencing Kelly Underwood as they look around and go out to the near side, and the mark taken nicely. Baltimore able to create some space. Uh, Austin happy to kind of cut them off in the middle, in the, in the halfback flank, and trying to do so, but it's picked up by Bryn Hansen, former Philadelphia Hawk, native of Perth. As the only person I know besides Val Cafaholi, he's the only person I recognize. Jesse Galston out there, former Boston Demon, but worth mentioning again, we do not have any any roster names or numbers for Baltimore, so we're sorry if uh, your, your friend slash uh, family member is not mentioned. There's a nice intercept mark uh, taken all the way, almost in the trees there by Mike Montgomery, number 36. Nice build up uh, there by Baltimore. Had that uh, kick out to the, to the boundary. They went back in corridor, which was great. Switched the field from there. So nice sequence on the build up, just not quite connecting on that last link. Seven minutes gone, still seven to nothing. And you think Baltimore would be pretty happy with where they are right now, considering the difference in sides. You know, Division I, Five-time defending national champions in Division One against a team that has battled valiantly in Division Two, made the grand final in 2019 on debut. And uh, there is a mark taken. Go in the middle of the ground. Here's Stefan Barbar, Bar, Black Sheep, have you any wool? Sends this one for two, have, two bites the cherry, and Campbell takes the mark. Grant Campbell, the Peter Dacos of the uh, U.S. AFL and a longtime stalwart. He should slot this one, you think. 
The mark is about 35 meters out. Cambo strolling in. The kick is up on the way. It is just off to the side. And no, it's there for a goal. The optical illusion of the goalposts. And Grant Campbell has kicked Austin second of the game. And a polite applause across the ground from Austin. They go to 2 on 13. No score for Baltimore. A little surprised they didn't get around him more. It was a nice play. It was a nice lead. Nice mark. He kicks the goal. Um, just watching the warm-ups, you know, in combination with what I just saw there, a few guys kind of lollygagging around. I wonder if Austin thinks they have this in the bag. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I don't. You, you might be right about that. And the thing is, is, is he kicks so, so many goals. Does Grant Campbell that perhaps, yeah, perhaps he was very much of the opinion that it's just another day at the office. Well, he executed, and that's what matters. Uh, the points are up on the scoreboard, and you're not taking them away now. A lot of teams have had trouble with that here today. Baltimore wins the tap and to advantage. And now looking around, able to get away from one tackler, able to get away from two tacklers as Hitch was able to disrupt the play. Aguiari is in there as well. You know what? He's not just a sentimental favorite. He's doing extremely well as he picked one up and across. This one is intercepted out of the air, sending this one out on the right side and oh almost got paid the mark should have in my opinion but it was Thomas o -O -O Sullivan as the ball goes into the middle of the ground he had it and then it hit off the Baltimore player's head he gets a second chance however goes into the pocket where it's marked he's going to run in does Grant Campbell easy as you like puts that one on a platter for Rob Pasolo and Pasolo kicks Austin's third 3-1-19 watch AFL scoreboard Baltimore no score Oh, just watch the wind go out of the sails of the Baltimore team right there. <laughs> yeah. And I hope that isn't full capitulation. Really nice individual effort. I missed the number of the Baltimore guy there that actually spoiled that mark yeah. in flight. And then nearly nearly got himself out of a one-on-two in that situation after having to go uh, pick up the football on the ground after spoiling. So ah, you'd like his teammates to get around him and say, hey, great individual effort. we got to get to you and get around you. And, and a little bit of extra gut running, Baltimore may have been able to run that out. Instead, Austin goes in, kind of just strolls in towards goal. Yeah, and that's the thing. You mentioned that, you know, you they still have 30 more minutes in this game. You need to get you, – you, you can't have a defeatist attitude. You have to play these guys tough because if you do, I don't know that they're used to seeing a team like this I think maybe Baltimore, Boston last year, Pat called that game between Austin and Boston, where, of course, the wind at Nationals last year really helped. I mean, Boston was, I think, only behind uh, by something like that, by not much at halftime, but Austin came back and won. But, you know, you have to play them tough. It doesn't matter who it is. You have to play who the team that's in front of you. Sending that one forward is 16 for the Crows. Bounces away, going to be picked up, rolled over. And there is Campbell again, and Campbell's going to kick another one. And again, polite golf clap from Austin. It's business as usual. Crows 4-125, Dockers no score. Watch AFL scoreboard. Uh, it's interesting to watch that sequence down in the pocket. Um, and, and in doing so, uh, you see the, the Baltimore players really kind of frozen. The Crows have multiple options. They're able to backtrack after fi picking up the football and evaluate those options. And so the patience that Austin is showing right now is paying off because the defenders are really frozen and not able to apply the pressure they'd like. Uh, Austin finds a way to thread the ball through and they're getting these chances on goal. Campbell's gonna have a field day. Absolutely, and, that, and, and that's the thing is that he's, I mean, he's so good and I don't know that they have an answer for him. They might have to sacrifice some of their better players sort of at the middle of the ground and tag him as the ball gets sent down up on the far side. Once again, Austin trying to clamor in for yet another score and the ball goes out of bounds once again. The Crows, as we said, eight national championships. They've won five in a row. That's more than anybody on the men's side has won in a row. Both the uh, the Golden Gate Iron Maidens women and the Denver women have more. The Maidens have won seven in a row. Denver has won six in a row. But for, for Austin, with such a large base of teams to win five in a row, I mean, it really takes a fact that they've built their club up. It's a deep club because not all the same players have played uh, year in and year out. And not all the same players have won best and fairest. I think only one multiple, and the, their eight national championships, only one player has won the best and fairest in the league more than once. Uh, actually, uh, 
bit of history, played with the Crows at, at their first Nationals as a split club when I was in my St. Louis days. So I think I'm entitled to take somewhere around 90 to 95 percent of the credit for all the success their club has had <laughs> in the last almost 20 years. And, and when I hear something crazy, I played against you. <laughs> I don't know if I played against you personally, but I was on the field. I remember that. Noor Jengir, dressed in navy blue from head to toe, running through the wilds of Colorado, kicking goals and breaking Philadelphia hearts. Matt King, there was a couple of guys on yeah, that Matt, team. Yeah, Matt King was Matt, in that crowd. Yep, that was, that was the very snowy nationals we had in Colorado Springs. Yeah, that's almost like when you say, don't mention Zavo, don't <laughs> mention the Colorado nationals. I uh, fond memories of it, but it was that was a cold weekend. It was. That was my first year. And the funny thing is, is that we you fly into Colorado Springs on the Friday. This was at the Air Force Academy. You fly into Colorado Springs on the Friday. It was 75 and beautiful. Get to the ground on Saturday, just pouring down with rain at about 45 degrees as they have added uh, yet another one as uh, Austin has kicked their fifth. 5-1-31. Or, nope, I apologize. That is, in fact, a behind. Hold, hold, the, hold the phone there. 4-2-26 to no score. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember it being cold and nasty and snowy. I needed a flare to signal from the goal square the women's <laughs> game that I did instead of flags as they come out to the near side, and the mark is taken by Montgomery, normally a back half player. He's now snuck up into the true right half forward position. Chipping this one in up over the top. And this one bounces away. Able to get this one and throwing that one onto the right once again is Fasolo. And that has bounced through for another one. And that was actually pretty. Six goal now, five fifth goal now as they go to 5 2 30. Two and still no score. And again, now, now they're just queuing up, Dan. Yeah. Um, you know, we asked earlier, did, did they think this was a foregone conclusion? And maybe they had a sense that uh, that they could run out big in this, but they've done the work so far. From the Baltimore side, uh, you know, I'd love to see them actually look at compressing the field a little bit more, um, tightening this up, giving players that, that maybe are a step behind the play more opportunity to get involved in those tackles and slow Austin down. Easier said than done. Uh, but if they're able to do that, they might be able to stem the tide here a bit. And they really haven't shown that they have any answers for them just yet. I mean, I don't know. I think oh, it's been a while since the ball's been on their offensive side of the ground. And um, they don't seem like they're being able to get through as they are eagerly clamping down are the uh, Crows. And there is Tyler Logston. Tyler Logston, rather, who came in and hugged him quickly. Watch AFL scoreboard. 5-2 plays no score. Brian Barrett, Dan Sarbacker, final of the nine games here at the U.S. AFL Super Regional Championships. Again, we're headed to Farmington, Utah. If you're out in that area, come join us in two weeks' time on the 29th of June for the Western Regionals. And remember, we'll be in, in Canada for the Transatlantic Cup in Toronto from August 2nd to the 11th. The USA Freedom women's team and the USA men's team will uh, be there in tow and uh, should be a fantastic week of football and uh, in a place I haven't been to in a while in Toronto. I've heard really good things about it. And uh, not only that, but we're going to be playing on the only dedicated Aussie Rules Oval in, the, in North America at uh, Sam Smith Park. Oh, fun. Uh, I didn't realize that that location was hosting. I uh, hadn't really paid attention to that uh, portion of the tournament yet, but yeah, that's super exciting. I've uh, played more games in Toronto than I can recollect, frankly, um, against the Canadians over my career, and um, actually quite a few different facilities that we've used over that time. And um, yeah, really looking forward to uh, to the European sides coming, Colombia from South America, uh, revisiting our very, very old uh, and deep rivalry with the Canadians. So yep. it'll be good. Appreciate them hosting. Yeah, it's uh, it's really an awesome event. And, you know, just working with some of the folks down on AFL County, I mean, they're always a joy to work with, uh, considering that, you know, they come down the Nationals a whole lot, obviously, with the Parallel Cup and Racine last year as Austin again moving forward and looking for another score. Yeah, I mean, we have a really good relationship, especially with the folks in AFL Quebec up in Calgary. Uh, you know, this, this new AFL Atlantic, seeing the game spread there, really happy with what they're doing. As this one is sent on the way, there is another one. And you can give that as a circling around. And I see there is a, a guy with a number on his back. And uh, all that matters is that they've kicked the goal. 6-2-38 for the Austin Crows. No score for Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore trying to uh, 
make some stuff happen there. So connected a kick out of the back, tried to play on, um, didn't see or hear the pressure uh, that was coming there. And uh, Austin's just been hot on it all day. They really haven't given much space for Baltimore to play. Applied the tackle, uh, rewarded the free kick. Results in a goal. I'm not going to tell you it's a six-goal breeze because it definitely isn't. But uh, <laughs> Austin's kicking with the wind this half. Uh, uh, not sure. Uh, not sure the wind is going to help. Uh, unfortunately for Baltimore, they're they're outclassed and outmatched at this point. Two minutes to go in this first half. We'll tell you while we have a second that the uh, the winners from the other divisions, the DC Eagles just locked up men's division two. The Chicago Swans alongside the Virginia Lions won men's division three and the Minnesota Freeze defeated Austin to take out the women's division. Their second, they're actually, let's go back a bit, they've actually won four straight central re uh, regional championships, won the central regionals in 2019, uh, won the 2022 regionals alongside Philly and a couple of other teams, uh, and then uh, winning last year, uh, winning the super regionals, uh, defeating Denver in the final game, and Minnesota looking again like they're on a collision course with Golden Gate in the grand final at Nationals this year. Class side, they've they've uh, built up that program. They keep recruiting. Uh, you know, just really impressed with the consistency they've had over the years. I think they're hoping to really crack through and bring the flag home this time. But uh, you know, it's it's looking like they are a class side in the comp, and and probably some expectation that they make make the grand final at Nationals again. That Minnesota women's team. Ball goes out of bounds. And, yeah, they've been, I think, you know, after beating Golden Gate last year and after coming within a goal of, of, of ending that long streak, and they've been doing they've been doing a lot of hard work. They've been doing a lot of work in the gym, both really their men's and their women's team have. So, you know, I think they're expecting that they are good enough to win the grand final this year. And they're going to be well represented up in Toronto. They had 10 members of the national team last year in the Parallel Cup. And so we'll have to see how they do as the ball tumbles out of bounds once again. Yeah, I know we, the way this game's gone, Brian, we can't help ourselves and start looking forward. Um, this weekend's always such a great litmus test for what we might see at Nationals. Who are the sides to keep an eye on? Uh, how are sides faring compared to the way they went last year? So uh, we're getting a taste, aren't we? Yeah, we absolutely are. And, of course, we have a new USAFL poll, which will not take the, into this uh, these weekend into account. That'll be for the July poll, but um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, Austin will probably remain number one. You'll probably still see Denver at number two. That is halftime here in this final game of the day, the final game of men's division round one. The score, it's the Austin Crows. Six goals, two behinds, 38 points. The Baltimore Dockers, no score, will return for the second half, the final 20 minutes of the day here from Darry Fields in Dublin Park, and you're watching us uh, it's the other way around, Darry Dairy Fields in Dublin, Ohio, and you're watching it on USAFL.com. This presentation of the USAFL is brought to you by Tasmanian. Quietly pursue the extraordinary. Coopers. Australian made and owned. Coopers Beer. Aussie Sports USA. The official apparel provider of the USAFL. Odin Mortgage and Tax, Australian Mortgages and Taxation for expats and overseas residents. CyberSolve IQ, the inaugural cybersecurity partner of the USAFL. Two Hands Restaurant, fueling your lifestyle. Watch AFL, stream every match overseas. Brown Brothers Family Winemakers since 1889. HBC Event Services, Premier Sports Medicine and the members of the USAFL. Back here at Darry Fields in Dublin, Ohio for the second half of the final game of the day and the final game of Men's Division One. The Austin Crows lead the Baltimore Dockers 38 to nothing. The Crows are 20 minutes away from winning their fifth regional championship. Brian Barish alongside Dan Sarbacker, USA Revolution coach and Sars. Uh, well, what's Baltimore. If you're Baltimore's coach, what are you telling them? Well, they do get the they do get the win this half. Um, so you know, a little bit uh, behind them, the kicks will sail a little bit further. Uh, it'll change the complexion of the game slightly. Um, look, yeah, you're you're behind by six goals, but it's a simple message. You've got to get more pressure at the contests. Uh, Austin's had first use of the football mostly, and here's a great example. Right off the, the, the tap, uh, Baltimore getting first use of the football and some good things happen into the forward line. Absolutely. Let's see if they can sustain it here as the ball gets moved around on the far side. 
And it's going to be picked up now. Going after it is uh, it's going to be a free kick and going out the back now. As we <laughs> move things around here, that one was Harry Kerr who had the football. Send that one up on the far side. Just seeing the game next door underway. Yep. So that's that's a Denver, uh, Minnesota freeze over there. Denver up uh, by five goals at halftime. Uh, what I say, six goals, one to one goal, one. Yep. So Denver's getting done what they need to, but they're not getting the help from Baltimore here. Yeah, and I was going to say, uh, if, if this was close, that score would be very, very interesting. But they're going to add uh, more points to the scoreboard here. It is, however, going to be a behind as that one tucks just inside the goal post. Uh, just outside the goalpost and through for another behind. 6 4 40 for Austin. No score for Baltimore. As this one comes out to the near side, nice mark going up and taking the mark there was, uh, was Zach McKinney. Zach's been around, former Denver, uh, Dallas Dingo, Waitley of Seattle. And it's funny. And we'll, we'll, we'll watch him, we'll ride with him on this kick. The kick is up on the way. It looks like it's tailing left. But in fact, I think he may have just, no, it did just tail left and through four behind. Watch AFL scoreboard goes to 6-5-41 to no score. Yeah, Zach McKinney, really talented footballer uh, in the Revo list. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, somebody I'm sure at home will know better than me. I think might have played. B grade amateurs over in Australia a couple seasons ago. Uh, I think that was the, the level he was at. So really talented footballer. Um, he's a great kick. He's a good user of the football. He's a guy. He's one of the standouts on the Revolution program. Yeah, and had a great great goal in the in the parallel cup last Yeah, year. and one 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 the Revos needed. Yeah, for uh, sure in a close game. Especially as this one is kicked on the way. I have a story about him, by the way, about that. Is that one is marked? right down in front and Austin looking to score another one. Again, it's Campbell and Campbell's gonna go back and do something he's probably done about a couple of thousand times in his long career, not just here, but back in Australia. And that is fix his shoes, go back and kick one from dead in front. He's such a, a talented player um, in a lot of ways you wouldn't normally recognize. I mean, his, his positioning, his timing on leads is just impeccable. And that's what makes him such a great forward is He's, he's nearly impossible to cover. Uh, you get that big booming kick out of the midfield there. I can't see exactly who that was. Is that number two? Yeah. Uh, just a thumping kick. That delivery was just massive. And uh, granted, spun his opponent there and, uh, you know, only took only took three steps basically to take that mark as the ball finished finished its flight. It just his timing was, was superb. James Bates is who that was. Thank number you. two, yep. Ball comes back in the middle once again. And on the watch AFL scoreboard, it's 7 5 47 to no score as the ball gets knocked free in the middle. And so the story I want to tell about Zach McKinney is that uh, his uh, his mom basically they were he was didn't realize that he was coming home from Australia, and his mom follows the US AFL socials, and uh, he was listed as being on the Revos and. He didn't want to spoil the surprise, so we actually blocked his mom for a week <laughs> from the social media so that uh, she wouldn't know, and the surprise was intact. Of course, I took me a while. I kind of forgot that I had blocked her, and he had to reach out to me again and be like, hey, can you unblock her? For yeah, okay. we, we don't want to block our fans. No, not at all. Some but of our biggest fans. No, but that was, I mean, but that was really, really cool, and the fact that he came home and he kicked, ended up kicking a goal and, you know, I mean, and that's the thing. Austin, <laughs> they've got a lot of talent. They don't need Zach McKinney. He is so, so good. They've already got talent up and down the park. When you add him to it, it's just like adding another log onto the gasoline fire. Yeah, a lot of, lot of depth on the side. Uh, we were kind of marveling earlier at, at what the interchange looked like and some, some really talented football players there and guys in the national team list. So, um, but funny, funny story. That's 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 hilarious and a uh, great opportunity to give a shout out to all the parents and uh, family and friends tuning in to see the players and hear the players' names called today. So, hi to everyone at home that's listening and tuning in. And our thanks to everybody who's stuck with us through eight hours. We've gotten it, and I just want to thank again the two gentlemen to our right. But before I'm sure we will, but 
uh, Craig Campbell, who uh, we discovered last year in Olathe at the Super Regionals. And uh, I told Doran James after three games, I said, we need to hang on to this guy. He was really good. And he joined us for both halves of the Parallel Cup. And then Jerry Long, the guy who does my footy pick, switching into a different role doing production. And we, uh, we slayed a couple of gremlins here today, but we've done very, very well. We've got a lot of really good feedback about this. And we hope you've enjoyed this at home, this uh this uh, we're spreading our wings a little bit in terms of uh, what we're bringing to you and we hope that you're enjoying either watching your friends and family uh, or, or if you're just a fan of Aussie rules on either side of the Pacific we hope that you're enjoying watching the sport of Aussie rules in the United States as this one gets sent down over the head of uh, JP Kirby and then kept in little handball going to get it picking that one up was Mr. Christian Merritt as the ball gets hen back over the top picked off by Kirby he got the ball ahead and very Bates is going to throw himself in there ball gets knocked free again going to pick that one up sliding in safe at third base was Mike Montgomery handballs it back on to Merritt. Merritt, another former USA Revolution player. That one gets knocked down for Solo, and that one was uh, volleyed out of the air, almost kicking in danger. Hitch able to send that one back in for Austin, and the ball is taken by Barr, who plays it. Has a bounce, has a look, has a shot for goal, and it's there. Another goal, the eighth of the game for Austin. Barr with his first, 8-4-52 to no score. Yeah, Baltimore was <clears throat> attempting to build out here on the near side, and they uh, they had connected the one pass, looked to looked to work up the boundary. Um, ultimately, they just they ended up kicking over the lines into into nothing, and didn't have enough tank to uh, enough in the tank to run onto it. So, ended up as a turnover, and uh, Austin through a series of slick handballs uh, ends up working the ball back up the same the same near side boundary here. Found find that inboard pass uh, and the entry and, and ultimately switched play and uh, found a goal out the back way. Second year in a row we've had a blowout for the final game although I will tell you that the humidity is a lot less this year so it didn't feel as torturous to call that this game as it was to call that game and the mark is taken once again and that is uh, Pasolo again. We haven't called. I was just thinking, we see Nolan Cox there. We'll talk about him in a moment. The kick is up on the way. It's fading across. Almost Mark was off his fingertip, but he's going to roll around, give himself some roof, Stefan Barr, and kick his second in a row. And that was a highlight reel goal by the by the coach. 9-4-58, Austin. No score for Baltimore. But let's go back to Nolan Cox for a second. Haven't really called him much in this game. They haven't really needed to talk to, about this much. But what a player he's turned out to be. And I'm sure there's a couple of people that might joke, although they're two different players, he's almost as good as his brother, if not maybe a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, obviously obviously tough to compare, yeah. like learning the game in two very different environments um, and getting utilized in different ways. Uh, actually, you know, so maybe one of the reasons we didn't mention him, he didn't start in the ruck. Uh, they yeah. had him off the halfback line initially, um, so a bit, bit of strategy there about where they wanted to use him, uh, probably to stabilize as a tall in the halfback line. Um, but they've had him in the ruck very consistently in the last, oh, at least at least ten taps, I think here, um, maybe not quite that many um, in the middle. And he's, you know, he's he's exerting himself. He's he's a good leaper. He's getting uh, he's getting the ball directed for the most part where he wants. Aside from that first tap of the second half for Baltimore, the first use. Now we talked earlier about our umpires, and I want to highlight the boundary umpire here. Most of the boundary umpires have been volunteers, but this is uh, a, a, a Dr. Ellen DeVries, who's come all the way from Melbourne. She's actually doing her postdoc, and I'm gonna. I, she has a PhD in genealogy, and she is a VAFA certified umpire, and she. Uh, reached out to us and said that she wanted to get involved. She's here this weekend. We'll see her at the International Cup. Not only is it great to have people, you know, with their talents from Australia, especially to umpire, but there are so it just reinforces my fact that she there are so many interesting people in the USAFL and she's one of them. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um you know, I think certainly I can speak from personal example through the sport. I've built built a really interesting network of people. Uh, globally, um, but especially in the U.S. and Australia, and uh, as expats come and go or Americans uh, go over to play or do whatever, you know, the, the network broadens and 
Um, it's fantastic. She's here. She's catching her sucking wind a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> the flow of the game here. Yeah. <laughs> if the camera was on her, I apologize because we caught her in a moment where she's trying to catch her wind there. But uh, good honor. She's covered this whole boundary, which is a big ask. Yeah, and, and I know she's, she's done a, a, a few games today. I think this was her third. I saw her doing the women's game before, which essentially was a uh, you know a game and a half because they there was only three teams. They were playing four by 15 minute quarters, whereas we're only playing two by 20 minute halves. The ball is run through the middle again and the ball gets uh, knocked in. Baltimore again, just kind of moving things forward a little bit. They're gonna get it inside 50 here. As this one goes in, good spoil out the back, but he's able to stay with the footy. Good little bump, handball. Here's a shot for goal to get on the scoreboard and they will. It's a behind, but it's not a goose egg. Yep. Watch AFL scoreboard, Baltimore one point, Austin nine four fifty eight. Oh, you'd want him to just steady those last couple of steps. He probably had the time to do it, square up, really make sure that kick is true. But there is that perceived pressure. Austin's been so hot on him all day. Uh, Baltimore finally breaks free and creates a really good goal scoring chance, but the perceived pressure in the head and he just rushed the kick and, and sprayed it. Mark by Christian Merritt. And let's talk about Austin for a second. Not their men's team necessarily because they've had all the accolades as here is Cox. He's being called upon. He's going to go back and was looking for Barr, but they were both moving away. And then he went to shove Barr off the football and forgot it as, as uh, Cox goes in. And it was a push in the back, absolutely. And we'll have a free kick and a 50-meter penalty because he didn't give it back to him. A yeah, little undisciplined, yeah, but... Yeah, lack of discipline there. You don't love to see that. Frustration or not, doesn't yeah. matter. Um, especially when you're this far ahead in the game. There's not much need for it. But, uh, yeah, Baltimore's starting to starting to find a few little avenues here. I know the game's probably, the result's probably out of question at this point, but you'd like to see them hit the scoreboard a few times. They're obviously a, a quality side. Um, just for them to be a, a, a good account uh, of their own capabilities and skills, um, you'd, you'd want for them to, to slot this home. Kick is up on the way. It looks good. It's short, but it didn't touch anybody on the way home, I don't think. It's a goal. Hey, Baltimore's got a goal against the Austin Crows. And on the watch AFL scoreboard, they got a 1-1-7, back to 51 points, 9-4-58 Austin. Hey, they deserve that. They chiseled that out. They got a little help from the 50. So a little bit of that, but hey, they took the opportunity and they got it. Absolutely. Um, you know, c can they double back and do it again? 100%. Um, what do they need to do to make that happen? I think th the intent of the ball, getters around the ball here, uh, stifle what, what um, Austin is trying to do here with their structures, see if they can if they can read off of Cox's tap, if he's getting the first use here and, and get the ball moving forward again. We mentioned, now we started to go into and talk about Austin. I mean, we see how well they're doing. And here comes another opportunity. Wow, they didn't wait very long. This is a one-on-one -on -one contest in the goal square. Bopped over everybody. There's like three crows there. And there is Campbell, and Campbell has kicked another one. And that did not, that was very, very close to hitting the goal post. 10-4, good buddy. 10-4, 64-117. Let's talk about, because that's another goal by Campbell. I started to talk about the women's team. The, they won three, first team to win three championships in three different divisions at Nationals. One Division One, won the Reserves Division, and Austin won the Women's Division Two. They had help from North Texas. But Austin has been such a really strong side. Now we're finally seeing the women come in, and they didn't get by Minnesota today. They, held, they stayed with Minnesota for, I think, the first quarter and a half before the freeze ended up coming home with, with a victory. But... This is slow, they're slowly building a complete club, much in the same way that we see from Golden Gate and Denver. Even after all these championships, now you really kind of feel like they're the complete, they're the complete package. Yeah, and so you'd love to reverse engineer that and say, can we sprinkle a little of that magic everywhere? And other clubs would be looking and say, how do we do that too? And I think my answer for that is it's the culture that they're building around that. And, and for them, so much of it um, is... There's football teams and competitive athletes on the field, men and women. Um, there's opportunities uh, for men and women to, to 
recreate, uh, but it's the socialization as well. I think um, Austin, I know in particular, has done a great job involving a lot of the families. Uh, so there's kids' days and things like that. There's volunteer opportunities. So, so much more around the club than just the athletics portion. Um, and that really attracts a lot of people and keeps people retained. And you can have, have roles, but Brian, you've been pitching people going to the website and finding a local club. You don't have to be one of the footballers. Not at all. Get involved. Get involved from an administrative side. Clubs always need that help on game days. Uh, running the club or just be part of the social atmosphere. Yeah, you really do. There's so much that that you that that you can do as a part of the league. And there's the thing is there's people who say, well, you know, I, you know, I've got uh, I'm injured and I'm not able to play sports. You don't need to play to be a part of it. I mean, I mean, and, I, and even players that are here, they say, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do after the play. There's so many places, so many things you can do. You can coach, you can umpire. Austin looking for another opportunity here as this one is taken down and we'll have a free kick. It will go to the way of Baltimore. They'll have a chance to clear it out. I mean, look, I always tell people, um, you know, you can do what you do and that is con and, and help out with commentary, help out with everything else. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to get involved here. And my, my mantra is, if you love the game, there is a place in it for you. You know, it might take a little bit of time to find your niche, but there is always something here. And we're seeing that, especially with a lot of players. And I think I, I instantly thought of Jessica Wuchner, uh, who just retired from AFLW, had a, a intent, immense successful career premiership player with Brisbane uh, a foundational player with Essendon and AFLW she was a member of the Boston Demons for uh, for one season in 2015 really left her mark on everybody good tackle by the way and here is big bad Daniel Brown who gets away sends this one in front over the top again going back Campbell was lurking so is Pasolo and Pasolo couldn't click it out cleanly and boots it over the line but in front for a boundary throw in but yeah Here's a woman who has done a lot and learned a lot, and now she's coaching the Tasmanian girls team in, pre in, in preparation for them joining AFLW in a few years. Yeah, some great connections for the league there. And, and you're right, Brian, there's there's a million different ways to get involved. Uh, I'm, I'm fully retired myself, but I, I hop on the media and, and uh, help you out a little bit here. Shout out to the Wisconsin Wombats Club. It's my home club now. Um, those boys come and train in my barn in the winter and uh, <laughs> come have a few beers in the basement. So we're trying to get that culture and club atmosphere built up there in Madison. And, uh, uh, yeah, any, anyone can do a bit of anything, and uh, it's, it's an awesome environment. We, we certainly love it, uh, love our footy, and uh, it's on display here this weekend at the, at the Super Regional. Two and a half minutes to go. Austin closing in on their fifth regional championship as they move in. Actually, now that I think about it, let's see, 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019, 22. Yeah, so this is actually their sixth, and that one goes through, and another goal for Austin. Watch AFL scoreboard 11-470 to 117 and now it's all over bar the shouting or it has been for some time and, and look Baltimore we've said this a couple of times I think Baltimore knew coming in they were in for a stiff test I think you know and you can look at it two ways it's like yeah look you're going to get you, you, you figured that this kind of result probably was going to happen but I like to think that you can learn something about playing a team like this even if it's something relatively small I mean there's only so much you can learn losing by 63 points but there are some good things here that they have done against the best team in the league absolutely and and uh, you know, there's a reason Baltimore was in the division one here um, this, there's an enormous amount of talent in this division uh, and coming from from a really wide swath of the country combining two regions here for us today so um, yeah awesome result again we talked earlier this is a great sort of uh, preview for us a litmus test of where clubs are at this point of the season uh, what are we about four months out from nationals or five uh, do my math properly till October so yeah they're they're mid-season now and um, we're getting a sniff at what uh, what we might see in Austin in uh, October yeah absolutely and uh, you know I mean Austin Austin, look, I mean, they, uh, you know, they've handled Denver well today. And, you know, it's interesting to see what ends up happening with the seeds, with how Denver does when they come in. And so, I mean, Austin really stamping their authority on this. But we've seen across all the divisions, there's a nice goal, I think. Absolutely. One more for the road as that one is slotted through. And give that to uh, the number nine, who is Justin Harris. I think that's his second. And that takes them on to 12-4-76 to 1-1-7.
And we've seen, you know, we're just running through the other champions as we did earlier, DC winning Division Two with a couple of players from New York, from from North Carolina, Chicago and Virginia taking out men's Division Three. We mentioned Minnesota winning the women's. I want to go back to Virginia. Darren Green has built a side there very, very slowly. It took a while, and then after the pandemic, this is sort of team they've they've won with Philadelphia last year. Uh, actually, yeah, they won with Philadelphia last year. They had some members of Philadelphia uh, the, se or, uh, the season before. They are in a place where I think if they can bring a full Division Three side, will they win? No, but I, not necessarily. But I think they could really kind of challenge. Yeah, I think I think that potentially could be a real competitive side uh, in that division, and, and that's a that's a real common sort of growth cycle we see. Those clubs get started, a little bit of traction. Pandemic was a big hiccup for a lot of them, and uh, I said it earlier. Everyone's had their own journey back from that, and to be honest, maybe two full seasons and a little bit. You know, we're only in June here, so really only two seasons since the pandemic. You can have a lot of expats or a lot of turnover in the club in that amount of time, so it's great to see footy back at this level here. Absolutely. Well, this game is done and dusted, and the Austin Crows are the 2024 USAFL Super Regional Champions. It's their sixth regional championship and their second USAFL trophy. Pretty comprehensive victory. I don't know that you and I can add too much to that, SARS. 76 to 7, the final score. And let's just sum up the entire day. Nine games. You did eight of them. Thank you so much for, for all of your help. And I think we saw a lot of, you know, there are a fair bit of blowouts, but I think all in all, we saw some good we saw some good Aussie rules tonight. Yeah, I saw some really competitive footy. Um, I've mentioned it a couple times. First bounce this morning, some really hot tackles right out of the gate. And I was like, man, that sets a great tone for the day. Hope the fans saw that and got excited. Uh, players certainly would have a, a, a gauge of where their fitness is uh, for a tournament-style format at this point of the season. Um, and yeah, this, there were some, some great competitive uh, moments and some competitive games here today. Congrats to Austin, Division One, to um, uh, DC. DC, thank you, and Division Two, uh, to Chicago, Division Three, and to the Minnesota Freeze women uh, in the women's division. So well done to all those players and everyone that came out. And we do want to mention those women's games. We will have them online on our, web, on our YouTube channel right here, youtube.com slash USAFL1997 hopefully in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for that. And, of course, we will be back in two weeks uh, in Farmington, Utah, for the USAFL Western Regionals as we see the Golden Gate Ruse and Iron Maidens, the Sacramento Suns, we'll see the Seattle Grizzlies, we'll see Portland, we'll see San Diego Lions, Orange County Giants, LA Dragons, uh, the Wasatch Wargles, the home team, the Arizona Hawks, the maybe the Las Vegas Gamblers. I think I got everybody out west. I think I did. So uh, that will just about do it. Uh, and I want to take a very brief moment, and not just not to pat myself on the back, but more or less an ode to everybody. This was my 300th game call, and I don't want to say I'm not. I don't want to give myself a pat on the back. I want to extend the thanks to everybody who is involved in the USAFL. Because here's the thing, it's one thing to be able to, to, to do this, but if it weren't for the interesting people of the USAFL, I wouldn't be, this would be absolutely no fun and I wouldn't have made it to 300 games. So if you're listening and you're a player, if you're listening back to this and you've played any sort of role in the, US, in the USAFL. We're getting the 300 <laughs> flashed up for Brian here. <laughs> Put your three up, Brian. I'll get There's you 300 the three. There games. We go. There he is, his 300. So everybody who's been involved <laughs> over the last 10 years, thank you so much. And, 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 that's, and that's just me showing gratitude because... There's been a lot of people who have come and gone, both uh, on the board, on the play, on the on the uh, for the players, the coaches, everybody who's shown tremendous support. And it's an honor that I get to tell everybody's stories. I've loved telling stories ever since I was a kid, and you know, to get the opportunity to do this for as often as I can. And listen, I'm not stopping anytime soon. I've got probably another 20 games this year uh, across a different. So my thanks, of course, to the people in my general vicinity, to Dan Sarbacker, to Pat Machado, again, for his work and his for getting here. T Jerry Long, who has made us look so good. Craig Campbell, who is part, you're part of the family, mate. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Thumbs up from him. Thumbs up Great. to him. Doran James, the ex executive director, who who's put all of this together and who does this. This is our 20, 20th or 21st regional tournament we've worked together. He does such a fantastic job. And every one of you who's watching, we'll see you in two weeks in Farmington. Until then, 
For now, this is Brian Barish wishing you a pleasant good evening from Dublin, Ohio. This presentation of the USAFL is brought to you by Tasmanian. Quietly pursue the extraordinary. Coopers. Australian made and owned. Coopers Beer. Aussie Sports USA. The official apparel provider of the USAFL. Odin Mortgage and Tax. Australian Mortgages and Taxation. For expats and overseas residents. Cybersolve IQ. The inaugural cybersecurity partner of the USAFL. Two Hands Restaurant, fueling your lifestyle. Watch AFL, stream every match overseas. Brown Brothers Family Winemakers since 1889. HBC Event Services, Premier Sports Medicine, and the members of the USAFL.